Hi, this is David Domus. Today I'm doing a book review on Blue Ocean Shift Beyond Competing Proven Steps to Inspire Confidence and Seize Growth by W. Chan Kim and Renee Marbron. In this review, I'm going to talk about Blue Ocean examples that are provided here in the book, major lessons learned, and an overview of the strategic tools that are provided. I hope you enjoy. This is a transformational book. After reading it, I've come up with several Blue Ocean strategies within my own industry based on the book. Now, I still have to go through and prove them out, but it's really opened my eyes. So this is a really powerful book and probably one of the more powerful books I've ever read. Now, I have read the Blue Ocean Strategy in the past, and what's different between the Blue Ocean Shift and Blue Ocean Strategy is that the Blue Ocean Shift really is a detailed plan. It gives you templates, gives you ideas on how to actually implement what you're learning. Let me go ahead and jump right into what you can learn from the book. I'd like to start by giving some examples that they gave in the book, really to help you understand the power of why you want to actually read this book and what kind of results companies have that take on a blue ocean strategy or a blue ocean shift. Let me go ahead and we'll give these examples and then we'll jump into some of the lessons and some of the tools that they provide. Uh, one of the examples they give is a company, Group Seb. They developed a product called Actifry, which is an electric French fry maker. What they were dealing with is a market that was shrinking by 10% a year. Also, the fryer industry, the French fry machine, the oil-based ones are dangerous. You know, they were unhealthy and they required oil. So they looked at it and they challenged some of the industry assumptions. And when they did, they realized that they could create a French fryer that instead of being full of oil would only need a tablespoon of oil. And that tablespoon of oil would give you fantastic results, fantastic flavor, but didn't have all the side effects or health issues. As a result of them challenging the industry assumption, they were able to cook with 40% less calories and 80% less fat. To show the power of what they did by changing this, Oprah Winfrey sent out a tweet that pretty much just stated, hey, I love this. It's changed my life. So that tweet helped it grow. So now that they've developed the Actifry electric french fry maker, they've actually taken the electric fryer industry and it's been increasing by 40%. The whole industry benefited by them coming out with it. The next example that I want to share from the book is Salesforce.com. Everybody knows who they are now. So they're a CRM company, customer relationship management company. When they jumped in, they took a different approach. They looked at currently, or at the time that they started, SAP, Oracle, IBM dominated the industry. They were expensive, time consuming to install with legacy systems, and really only large and complex companies could afford them. But what they did was they took a market creating strategy. You know, what if we based this on the internet and made CRM systems available to small and mid-sized companies? Well, this shift has amazing results. Within 10 years of starting, they were doing 1.3 billion in annual sales. Now they have 20,000 employees with annual revenues approaching $8 billion. Now talk about a shift, that's incredible. Another example that they gave just to say, I mean, how happy would you be if you were able to get this type of result? Let's look at Citizen M Hotels. How happy would you be if you had an average occupancy rate of 90%? Now, to put this in perspective, that 90% occupancy rate is 80% higher than the industry average. They've also reduced staffing costs by 50% below the industry average. Well, how did they do that? By needing half the people. They also reduced the rim size by 50%. Now, some people may say that, why, why, why would you make a room smaller? Do people really want that? Well, what they did instead was to be able to have a 50% smaller room, they looked at having high-end beds, the finest sheets, fluffy towels, rooms that were really quiet, free internet, use of local caterers to provide and sell the food instead of having their own restaurant in-house. They'd find people within blocks that sold food and had them selling food within the hotel so they didn't have to do it themselves. They even outsourced housekeeping. Now, additionally, They've actually gone into pre-manufactured rooms. The lower floors are actually built as any other hotel is, 
but they are actually the rest of the the hotel rooms themselves are all prefab they come completely assembled all the electric all the wiring all the all the essentials are there so they can go together what that does for them is it reduced the cost of building a hotel by 35 percent and also reduced the construction time of a new hotel by 35 to 50 percent impressive Now, we look at this, and this all happened within 10 years. So in 2007, and they set out to open a new value frontier. They interviewed frequent travelers of three-star hotels and of five-star hotels to determine what the reason was people stayed or picked one over the other. They didn't open their first location in Amsterdam till 2008. So here's the thought process. They interviewed frequent travelers. They interviewed both the five-star and the three-star people that stayed at both of them. And, you know, they started with the five star and to their surprise, people didn't stay because they had bellhops. They didn't stay there because they had doormen. They didn't stay there because the front desk was nicer or better. They didn't stay there because there was a concierge. They didn't stay there because hotel restaurants. They didn't stay there because of room service. And they definitely didn't stay there for internet and phones because most high-end hotels actually charge for those. So when you look at all these things, most of those items that the five-star hotels provide, people wish they didn't have. The primary reason they pick five-star hotels is they have great locations, they have great beds, great sheets, quiet, and they have a great shower. So when they looked at people staying at three-star hotels, The reason they picked three-star hotels is price. And they also picked it because some of the five-star hotels felt a little too hoity-toity. They didn't like the feel. Some people don't feel welcome in a five-star hotel because it just has a stuffy feeling. But looking at it, they thought, what if we added all the things that people liked in a five-star hotel and got rid of what they didn't like? Adding luxury and beauty... Well, part of the things on a three-star hotel that people didn't like about three-star hotels is they didn't have luxury or they weren't beautiful. They felt a little institutional and they weren't inspiring, but the locations weren't as good. So the primary things people look for from the five-star hotels really came down to just a few items. Number one, location. Two, they had a great bed, high-quality sheets, the rooms were quiet, and a great shower. So that knowledge provided Citizen M with the ability to eliminate the front desk and develop a check-in that's similar to ATM machines with only one person in there to answer questions. It was just you know, brilliant the way they did that to really simplify the process and really looked at things that challenged the industry norm. So they've done a great job with that and found out a lot of things that five-star hotels are doing people really don't want anyways. And that's why their occupancy rate is as high as it is. And they're able to have less staffing and be more profitable because their real estate costs are less because they have smaller rooms. They can fit more rooms into the same amount of space. Citizen M Hotels is definitely an example that everyone should follow. Couple others, health media. Now this is interesting. The problem they were facing is, you know, the company had to reduce staff to 18 people from 85, and it was all based on performance. In 2006, their CEO set a goal from going from five million dollars in annual revenue all the way to a hundred million dollars in revenue in four years. Pretty aggressive goal. So he's looking at how can we hit that goal starting from where we're at. So they looked at doing things differently. This was a blue ocean shift. As a result, though, of their blue ocean shift, in just two years, Johnson & Johnson bought a company for $185 million that two years earlier only had $5 million in revenue. You may be asking yourself how they did that. And they looked at things again to see items from a different perspective than what the industry norm was. So their competitors were either phone-based consultations, more expensive, and those consultations really were only used by people that couldn't really get answers from doctors. It really wasn't as useful. Or the industry also had low-cost providers, which were online services, but the information was really general and didn't help people with chronic illnesses. So those services weren't very useful either. So what they did is they created a new market, digital health coaching. Instead of someone talking to them or just general information, they went deeper. They developed online questionnaires. So those questionnaires gave specific recommendations and increased the ease of use of the internet for this purpose and the speed and gave them the ability to find answers that they struggled to find elsewhere on the internet. The company really just took off from there. 
Next, I'm gonna talk about Wawa. It's a really impressive company. They have 700 locations in six states with annual revenues of $10 billion. They started out with convenience stores and they have gas stations and they also provide food. But what's impressive is the way they perfected their three businesses, how they've combined the convenience store, the fuel retailer and food services all into one business. Now, think about this. So Wawa has per location sales three times higher than 7-Eleven does. Additionally, it's part of their blue ocean strategy. They looked at their weakest point, which was the food services. And they looked at it to determine how can they truly be different than everybody else? Well, they decided to bring in the best foods, you know, fresh foods, all that kind of stuff. Something that you wouldn't expect in a convenience store, gas station type environment. They don't have tables, they don't have drive throughs but the results of partnering with other companies to bring in those food services has really done something miraculous. Their average daily food sales is higher per location than that of the average McDonald's per location. So pretty impressive results. All of these are examples of blue ocean shifts. So hopefully you've learned something from those. I want to go in a little bit into some of the top lessons here, just some of the ideas that you may want to consider. You know, really the book is focused on market creation. It's not about imitating, it's about creating. They talk about market share as a lagging indicator. It's all based on past performance. Really, the companies that are making blue ocean shifts are focused on value innovation and value improvement. They create a true leap in value. Past performance, you know, some of the examples they gave in there about lagging indicators. Apple brought out the iPhone. Who would have thought that BlackBerry, who by far was a dominant player in the industry, if you used market share as an investment, you know, I'm going to invest in BlackBerry. Well, it was the wrong investment. Apple and their iPhone brought in value innovation, and it was a true leap in value. So just a quick lesson there. When it comes to the employees, they stress, you know, the people must be part of the process. If they've been involved with the process. They understand why you want to make this shift or these changes. And there's true buy-in that, to lead, and they, they understand that this is the right thing to do. Now, another lesson in here was experiencing what your customers experience. Not at a high level. I mean a really down-to-earth, gritty experience. They gave an example of a pharmacy. They had all the executives in there, and they're all in a meeting, and the CEO is asking, I need one volunteer. And finally, one of them raises their hand reluctantly. Question was about what's it like being sick, calling off sick, or whether you stay at work. So these people go in, and they all follow them back to their house, and this person has to pretend to be sick. Well, then they make them call a doctor, set up an appointment, and everybody's in there with them at the doctor's appointment. Even though they really weren't sick, the CEO wanted them to experience everything. So they continue to walk through that process, not only stop there, but also, even though they didn't get a prescription, what would we have to do next? Call in to the pharmacy and what all the, the hassles are. Well, this starts at like 8.30 in the morning, and they don't finish until like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Then they get back in a meeting. And, but that's, that's the buy-in, really understanding what people go through when they go to a pharmacy. They had everyone live through that. And then so they decided that's where the idea of like the minute clinics came from and everything. It was a blue ocean shift. How much time could we save people if they just went to the pharmacy, saw a nurse practitioner there? I will tell you that, you know, the book goes into much more detail, but I'm just giving you a kind of a, a top, a topical view of this. So another uh, lesson is, you know, really, you got to look across your industry and, and really understand why someone chooses your industry over another. So one of the examples that they gave in the book is why does somebody choose to have an electrician come to their house? Or why does someone go to a hardware store and do it themselves? You know, what are the trade-offs people make? Also, another lesson in the book is how to create trends versus keeping up with them and how that puts you in a much stronger position. So really, you want to be creating trends rather than following. Another lesson from the book is that many of the Blue Ocean companies hire for attitude and values rather than experience or education. So they want people that are have the right attitude and the right value that are really focused on their customers. So that's, you know, in my experience as well, is that is so important to have people that really care about your customers and, you know, care about your customer's experience. Another lesson is when launching a blue ocean strategy, you start small, then go fast and wide. 
So in the Citizen M example, you know, as I was talking about earlier, what they ended up doing was they researched it in 2007, 2008, they came out with one location. They refined it, made sure they got that working perfect. And then next, they opened a second location, did some more refining, and then they just started going and launching these all over the place. What a lot of people do is when they come out with a new idea or a new strategy is they just start wide. They release it to everybody. Well, what happens when you release that to everybody is those little errors that if it was just one location get magnified over all the locations. So if you're somebody working with 500 locations and you launch something and there's little issues, you're getting phone calls from 500 different places. But if you would have fixed all those, put all the processes and all that in place beforehand, before you took it wide, you would have been much better off and you have a much higher success rate. So those are really powerful lessons. So why do you want to buy the book Blue Ocean Shift? And I recommend everybody that's listening do that because it is, as I said earlier, a powerful book. You know, I really got a lot out of it and really has me looking at things differently. So the authors provide a step-by-step detailed action plan to create your own Blue Ocean Shift. So the first step is just get started. Step two, understand where you are now. Step three, imagine where you can be. Step four, find how to get there. And step five, make your move. Sounds pretty easy. A lot more involved than that, obviously. But what's great is they provide tools, templates, all that kind of stuff to really walk you through this step by step. So if you're serious about creating a shift and you use the tools in this book, your success rate is going to be much higher. And they even give you the downside of some of these things. So, you know, the, the things to look out for, because a lot of people when trying to implement a blue ocean shift will miss some of these things or jump to conclusions or jump to assumptions. They teach you how to verify that your thoughts are right and that you're making the correct actions and that this will happen. Some of the tools that are provided. So they have the Pioneer Migrator Settler Map. And what this does is helps you identify areas where the biggest blue ocean opportunities are in your industry. And obviously everybody wants to know where the biggest blue ocean opportunities are within their industry. You've got the strategy canvas, and this helps you see what everyone in the industry competes on. What I've seen in my career is majority of companies are me too companies. And what you gotta focus on is differentiating yourself. Then they've got the buyer utility map, which helps you identify customer pain points. And as a salesperson, you hear about pain all the time, but this looks at it differently. You know, it really focuses on how do I remove the pain? I'm the least painful of these options. You know, I'm better than these companies at it. But what the Blue Ocean strategy does and what the buyer utility map does is takes it so you can identify those things and question the industry norms. How do I remove the pain points completely? And why do we make customers settle? Because, you know, everybody in, in, in one industry may have to deal with a certain issue. Well, what happens if we remove that certain issue? Does it really need to be there? But it's become the industry norm, so everyone just goes with it. So what that does is just help you look at, find the pain points, and remove them so you're actually a, a much more user-friendly product. They also go into the three tiers of non-customers and how to identify them. It's the soon-to-be non-customer, refusing non-customer, and the unexplored non-customer. And every industry has all three of those. They also have the six paths framework, which provides structure to the Blue Ocean creation. The next tool that they provide you is the four actions framework. These are important. You look at these four things. What can you eliminate? What can you reduce? What can you raise and what can you create? Those are things to help you create that blue ocean. And then the last step that they have in the process is an item that really helps you take those items, the the different blue ocean opportunities you've identified and different teams put them together. And you can focus on this and determine which way to go, which one of the blue ocean opportunities to pursue, or maybe you decide during that step to combine them. And that's what they call the blue ocean fair. So it's just something to help you take the items and grow with it. Now, I will tell you that the blue ocean shift was a fantastic read, really, really helpful. 
And I'm going to be going through all of those steps multiple times. And as I read this, I mean, ideas were going off in my head the whole time. I mean, it really, you know, opened up my mind to different opportunities. And the way I envision a blue ocean now, I guess how a blue ocean really works if you do it right, it's almost like a riptide. You've got the ocean. Everyone's competing in the waves. The riptide is just something that popped in my head on how to describe this. So everyone's fighting the wave. They're just in there in the bloody red ocean, just fighting, 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 fighting. Well, if you create a blue ocean, what happens is it's like the blue ocean that that where the riptide would be in this metaphor is that the riptide will pull you out into that blue ocean quickly. So if you if you find a way not to have to fight in the wave, not, to not have to compete against the people directly head to head with a Me Too product, that you do something that's value creating in the industry, it'll just pull you out into a blue ocean and you get past the entire red ocean and it opens up and it just gives you a massive opportunity. Really, the blue ocean and the blue ocean shift is about finding new market. And with that said, I would just recommend that each of you go out and get the book. I do have a link to the book down below over on Amazon. I hope you've enjoyed this book review and you found it useful. I also hope that you subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Why Buy From You is dedicated to finding the reasons people buy. Focus on sales, marketing, and branding. Focused on the reasons people buy.